here's a simpler model of an antibody, which we have two red light chains, two yellow heavy chains. And right out here at the tips then, this is what we've said is the antigen binding domain. So here, the shape of this surface, as well as the chemical properties of the side chains that line that surface, are complementary to the shape and chemical properties of this protein epitope. So it binds not one, but actually two antigens, two identical antigens. So, so um, an antibody then is bivalent in that way. And you might ask yourself, why is this antibody symmetrical in this way? So that it can bind two identical protein epitopes. That's a great question, and I'm not going to answer that question because that's something I think you and your MAPS team should discuss and try to come up with a rationale for why nature would have evolved a protein like this that is symmetrical and able to bind two identical epitopes on each of its two arms. Now, <clears throat> let me talk just a little bit about an application then. So, we're all interested in vaccines to coronavirus. The vaccine, it's hoped that the vaccine is going to stimulate the production of an antibody which is capable of binding then to this spike protein on a coronavirus. So there's our little model of an antibody that's going to bind to the tip of this spike protein. All right, so let me try to show you how this works in slightly more detail. This is a physical model of the spike protein. So this red protein here is the same as this protein. And again, you're not going to be able to make much out of this in this short introduction, but there are actually three identical spike proteins in this complex. So spike is a quaternary protein with three copies of spike. And one of the three spikes, namely the one shown here in this blue backbone model, this domain right here, which is called the receptor binding domain, the RBD, it is flipped up into what we call an open conformation. This is now ready to bind to its receptor, something called ACE2 on the surface of cells in your respiratory system. So we want to make, or, or vaccine makers, want to make antibodies that are going to bind to some epitope on this receptor binding domain. Because if we can coat this with antibodies, then we're going to inhibit this coronavirus from finding the ACE2 protein. So you can think of this receptor binding domain as being a protein epitope, which then is going to bind to the antibody like so. So that's what the vaccine developers have been trying to do. They've been trying to figure out what part of this receptor binding domain of the spike protein do we want to target with our antibodies. And then how effective is, is our antibody in binding to and preventing the normal infection process that this spike protein goes through. So I've been talking about the structure of an antibody using models, but now I just want to show you, I guess, four slides that I've sort of found in Google Images that basically tell you the same thing. And, you know, this, this is going to be kind of redundant to what I've just said using models. So if you're comfortable with all of this, you don't have to worry about going through this part of the video. But here's an image, slightly modified from what I found on... Uh, on the web. And I like this one because it very clearly shows the modular nature um, of an antibody. Each one of these ovals represents an immunoglobulin fold. So here's a light chain made up of two folds. Now there's, here's a new term that I haven't introduced before. This VL stands for the variable region of a light chain. And this is the constant region of a light chain. Similarly, the heavy chain has a variable domain out here on the tips where it's going to bind the antigen. And then it has a constant, one constant region, a second constant region, and a third constant domain. All right, so you, you might, you may, you'll read about variable and constant domains of these chains. 
You'll also notice that it shows here two lines between these heavy chains. These are disulfide bonds. All right, let me go to the next slide, the next image here. And this shows essentially the same thing, but with a few more details. Uh, here's our two immunoglobulin folds, variable and constant. Uh, now we show on this the antibody, I'm sorry, the antigen, which is bound to the tips of these variable domains. Notice that they're similar in, they're, they're identical in shape, so each arm will recognize the same antigen. Here's our disulfide bonds joining two heavy chains together. There are two of them in this linker region between these two domains. You'll also note here that now this one is showing that there's a disulfide bond that joins the two light chain, I'm sorry, the light chain to the heavy chain. Okay. Uh, some more details down here we don't need to get into. This is sometimes referred to as the effector region and there's a little bit of carbohydrate that modifies this particular domain of an antibody. Its role is, is not really important. I'll emphasize again that each one of these immunoglobulin folds is made up of approximately 112 amino acids. Alright, now here's another image that goes one step further because it relates this immunoglobulin fold here to its real structure here. Let me back up for a minute. See here that here's the disulfide bond that characterizes each of these immunoglobulin folds. And here you can see, not very well, but what they're trying to show you is a four-stranded beta sheet opposite a five-stranded beta sheet. And this black bar here and the black bar here represents the disulfide bond that joins those two sheets together. So this is just another image. Again, they're all showing you the same thing, but in a slightly different way. And then here's one more image, computer-generated image, of an immunoglobulin fold. You see the two sheets, green and yellow. And the one new thing here, then, are the loops that are on the end where you find the N-terminal end. This is the N-terminal end of this domain. The C-terminal end is down here, where it then is joined to the next domain. But on the end where you find the N-terminal, you'll find three loops. These are referred to as the hypervariable loops, also known as the complementarity determining regions, or CDRs. There's a CDR1, CDR2, CDR3. These are the amino acids in these loops that make up the antigen binding domain. So they determine the specificity of each antibody. And we'll be talking a lot more about that in the the next section of this video.